All right, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you once again uh, for joining us uh, for NB Heart Center TV uh, weekly rounds. Uh, this week, uh, Dr. Chris White uh, is, uh, is gonna be presenting on uh, the mechanical circulatory support experience here at the New Brunswick Heart Center over the last 18 months. Uh, this uh, pr uh, promises to be an exciting talk and uh, I wanna give him as much time as possible, but just by way of qu quick introduction, Chris joined us uh, uh, basically about a year and a bit ago now in September of 2019 and uh, has, uh, has really as, as part of his uh, training, uh, both in Edmonton and at, uh, and at Duke uh, in, in the um, field of heart failure and, and, and transplantation has really helped to uh, grow the program here where we were once upon a time, a fairly simplistic uh, VA ECMO slash Impella program for uh, acute mechanical circulatory support. We've really evolved considerably since then. And I think a lot of people can attest to that. So I want to give Chris an ample amount of time here to present uh, really an update from the last 18 months. So Chris, thanks so much uh, for your uh, for your leadership on this and, and, and off to you. Thanks, Ansar, and thanks for uh, the opportunity to present. I really want to, um, you know, highlight a, a few cases um, uh, that I think exemplify the the breadth of mechanical support options we we have and the types of patients that we've supported. Um, I'll you know talk briefly about the different types of mechanical support that exist, both short term and long term, um, and uh, and then kind of the growth of the program over the last eighteen months in terms of some. Uh, numbers of patients supported and outcomes, and then we'll get back to the conclusions of the of the cases at the end. So the first patient I want to discuss is a 21-year-old female uh, who was involved in a, a motor vehicle collision. She ended up uh, upside down in a car in a drainage ditch underwater, so she had, uh, you know, a prolonged drowning event. Um, there was a a difficult attempt to get her out of the car. And when they finally got her out, she had an additional 45 minutes of CPR before they were able to make, uh, to obtain a perfusing rhythm. In the emergency department, her pH was lower than the blood gas machine would read, as was her bicarb. Um, she was unable to be ventilated. She was on a very high dose of epinephrine, was blue and mottled. Uh, but given her young age, uh, we placed her on VA ECMO in the emergency department. Uh, so this is how she was cannulated. She had a big venous drainage cannula up from her femoral vein into her right atrium, which can be seen here on her x-ray, returned to her femoral artery with a distal perfusion cannula in her superficial femoral artery to make sure her leg uh, had maintained perfusion. And you can see on her x-ray here, um, you know, essentially a complete whiteout of her lungs bilaterally. So in addition to profound uh, cardiac depression, she had uh, profound lung insult. Second patient, 63-year-old male admitted with uh, late presentation inferior STEMI, cardiogenic shock and intubated prior to proceeding to the cath lab. In the cath lab, he had a precipitous decline both in his hemodynamics and his respiratory status. Uh, he was on very high dose of vasoactive agents and had a PO2 in the 40s despite maximal ventilation. And it was clear that cardiac arrest was imminent and this was all due to as you can see on his LV gram here, torrential mitral valve regurgitation. Uh, so he was cannulated essentially the same way uh, in the cath lab. Uh, and you can see on his x-ray here, um, you know, profound pulmonary edema, uh, which would account for his uh, uh, precipitous decline from both a cardiac and respiratory perspective. Patient three is a 45 year old male who had a late presentation anterior STEMI. Um, he actually was not in shock on presentation uh, but was driven emergently to the operating room by recurrent VT on the ward, requiring multiple shocks. Following his cabbage, uh, we were unable to wean from cardiopulmonary bypass. We weren't even able to get the aortic valve to open with large doses of inotropes. Uh, so we left the operating room in this configuration. So it was VA ECMO with an LV vent. So a drainage cannula again in his IVC right atrium that was wired together with a venage a drainage cannula from its LV apex and then return to his ascending aorta. In the ICU postoperatively, he developed refractory VT, uh, which you can see here on the screen, VT at 213 beats a minute, though because of how his cannulation strategy was, he had a completely stable hemodynamic profile with a map of 72, albeit a completely flat art line. 
Um, and you can see his RV in the VT is not uh, contributing at all to his cardiac output with a CVP and mean PA pressure that are the same number. Finally, patient number four is a 47 year old gentleman who had a left main STEMI. He was transferred to the heart center in profound cardiogenic shock on 0.7 mics per kilo per minute of norepinephrine. This is his terrifying looking uh, angiogram uh, and our interventional colleagues were able to get you know, an excellent result getting this left main open. Subsequent to as PCI, he was transferred back to the CCU now on two mics per kilo per minute of norepinephrine. He has a respiratory arrest in five minutes of CPR um, and uh, is in you know, extremis essentially with a pH less than seven and has a PEA arrest while we're cannulating him for VA ECMO. So those are the four cases I wanted to, uh, to present and we'll get back to the conclusions of those cases at the end of the talk. I wanted to transition now briefly just to talk really about the spectrum of mechanical support options that are available. Um, the first category is really short-term MCS. Um, and this is designed to treat patients in acute cardiogenic shock. These are cheap circuits, cheap disposables that can be instituted rapidly as a bridge to decision. And what I mean by that is it buys you time uh, to reestablish end organ oxygen delivery and interrupt the, their shock state. It buys you time to recover their end organs and hopefully interrupt the multi-system organ failure spiral that these patients are all in. Um, it allows you to see what their, their brain status is, particularly in post-arrest patients. Um, and then it'll, it buys you time to determine whether or not they have sufficient native myocardial function to be weaned from support and if not, uh, can be used as a bridge to either durable VAD or transplant. Um, so any cardiogenic shock patient, short-term MCS options are, are the direction we go. And this is just an example of all the different short-term options that exist. Uh, so for RV support, we have the Protect Duo RVAD, which is a per percutaneously inserted dual lumen cannula that we use for RV support. Um, on the left side, there's the spectrum from balloon pump to impella um, to tandem heart. Um, and then in the middle here, the overlap, because it provides both RV and LV support and pulmonary support is VA ECMO. Um, and essentially the same pump and cannula components can be used uh, to provide LVAD, RVAD, BIVAD support or VA ECMO support, just depending on how you uh, arrange the cannulas. Um, and you can see here also the different magnitudes of support. So a balloon pump might give you half a liter, a liter a minute of flow, impella somewhere in the middle, uh, and VA ECMO, you can essentially get as much flow as you want, depending on your cannula size. This is in contrast to durable mechanical support, which is used as either a bridge to transplant or as destination therapy. So as permanent replacement uh, for a patient's LV uh, over a period of years. The two pumps on the market currently are the Heartware HVAD, uh, and then the third generation HeartMate 3 um, are the you know, two pumps available. And you can see it here um, in this cartoon. So the HeartMate 3 attached to the LV Apex with an outflow cannula that goes to the ascending aorta. This is attached to a drive line to, and a controller, which is the computer that controls the pump, uh, and then battery packs that the patient wears uh, on shoulder holsters, which you, you know, you may see this patient walking around and not even be aware uh, that they have one. I wanted to highlight the outcomes for patients supported with uh, these durable pumps. Uh, this has been a dramatic change over time since these pumps were first implanted. Uh, you can see here now that one year survival is in the 80% range. This is with you know, over 12,000 implants worldwide. And importantly, when you look at the pink line, which is the current generation HeartMate 3 pump, um, compared to the orange line, which is the outcomes of transplant over time. You can see now that we're in a range where the current technology is allowed uh, for support that may have a comparable out outcome to transplant. Now, we don't have 10 year outcomes like we have with heart transplant, uh, but I think suffice to say that technology has had a dramatic impact on the survival in these patients. So what about mechanical support at the heart center? Um, this is intraortic balloon pump utilization at the heart center over time. Um, 
it does appear that in the last year, we have used more balloon pumps than uh, we have historically. I think part of this is driven by the evolution of the shock team uh, that has been developed at the heart center over the last couple of years, which really focuses on uh, uh, early acquisition of objective data. So getting an art line, getting a lactate, getting a, a swan gans catheter and a cardiac index and a mixed venous sat and using that to really help guide who are the patients that need a balloon pump and who are the patients that need more support than a balloon pump can offer. Um, when you look at ECMO utilization uh, at the heart center over time, historically there was one or two ECMO runs a year. Uh, up until 2019, there was 12. And in the last 12 months, uh, in 2020, there was 20 ECMO runs. Um, and you know the other thing that's changed over the last 18 months is uh, we've developed a mobile ECMO program within the hospital. So this is our ECMO cart that we can wheel anywhere in the hospital that has everything we need on it to cannulate a patient um, and, our, and an ECMO circuit. We've now cannulated patients in the operating room, obviously, but in the surgical ICU, the CCU, and the emergency department. Uh, we've done cannulations for both VA and VV ECMO awake when necessary. Um, and then we've used all this technology to provide VA ECMO support, LVAD support, RVAD support, and BIVAD support. Uh, in addition, we've uh, had a number of uh, ECMO for respiratory indications. So this is um, our most recent VV ECMO patient uh, who has cannulated awake. Uh, and this is him on his uh, daily physio routine. Um, with the right IJ crescent cannula, you can see here connected to the ECMO circuit that's trailing behind him. When you look at the spectrum of, of support over the last 18 months, um, post-cardiotomy represents about a quarter of patients. So these are people that could not be weaned from cardiopulmonary bypass. A quarter have been supported for profound cardiogenic shock. 20% um, were respiratory indication VV ECMO runs. 10% uh, were eCPR, so cannulation with VA ECMO while CPR is ongoing. Uh, and then we've had 20% uh, ECMO use for uh, supporting high-risk PCIs. The mean age of these patients is 58, uh, with a range of 21 to 87 years of age. Obviously, the patients in their um, you know, late 70s and 80s are the, are the patients that were supported for PCI. And a mean duration of support of four days uh, the longest duration so far up to 25 days. When you look at our outcomes over the last 18 months, survival to decannulation despite a very sick patient population is 78%. Survival 24 hours post decannulation is 74%. And overall a 60% survival to hospital discharge. And I would say this compares um, favorably with outcomes at you know, large transplant centers um, you know, that do hundreds of ECMO runs a year. This is a very, you know, standard number hospital discharge rate of, uh, you know, in the 50 to 60% range. When you look at survival over time, uh, historically, um, you know, our first uh, survivor was in 2019. Uh, and overall in that calendar year, we had a survival of about 15%. Um, and our hospital survival rate uh, in 2020 was 75%. And even if you eliminate uh, the five patients we've supported for PCI, which are a very different kind of ECMO run and all, you know, arguably a lower risk ECMO run, even when those patients are eliminated, our survival to hospital discharge in 2020 was still 65%. So I just wanted then to end with uh, kind of the conclusions of, of the four cases that uh, we started with and then hopefully have some time for discussion. So if you remember, our first patient was a unfortunate 21-year-old female with a drowning event, prolonged CPR, um, who was in uh, you know, a moribund state in the, uh, in the emergency department when she, when she was cannulated. When we returned to the intensive care unit, the arterial oxygen saturation from her right hand was 70%. Um, and this is due to something called North-South syndrome, so you can see in this diagram here that the VA ECMO circuit draws venous blood from her right atrium and returns it to the femoral artery, which is the red blood uh, being shown coming up her descending aorta. The blood that the ECMO circuit does not capture um, still depends on native lung function to oxygenate. And because her lungs are essentially non-functional, 
that blood is not oxygenated, ejected out the aortic valve. Um, and so the blood that the coronary arteries and the brain sees is what has come through the left ventricle. Um, and so you can see in her case, that blood had an O2 saturation of 70%. Um, and not surprising given what her chest x-ray looks like. So the solution here was to add a second cannula up her left femoral vein. Um, and that can be seen here ending in her right atrium. Uh, so the venous blood to the pump was still through this large multi-stage cannula, but the, ven the return from the pump was both to her femoral artery and to an additional cannula in her right atrium. So this was called VAV ECMO. So we're pre-oxygenating the blood that's going through her right heart so that the blood that her head and, and coronary see is oxygenated. So this is a hybrid between VV ECMO and VA ECMO. By day three of ECMO support, her lungs had recovered, or sorry, her heart had recovered to a sufficient state that she could be transitioned from VAV ECMO to just a venovenous cannula in her left subclavian vein, um, which was then providing only pulmonary support. So she was transitioned to VV ECMO at day three of her post-operative stay. By day seven, her lungs had recovered sufficient function that she could be decannulated from VV ECMO. She was weaned off mechanical ventilation six days later and transferred to the medicine ward and post-op day 20, post-admission day 25 was discharged home uh, with intact neurologic function. Patient two, this was the patient with the late presentation, inferior STEMI, papillary muscle, ru muscle rupture and, and profound mitral valve regurgitation who was uh, peri-arrest in the cath lab. This was his x-ray following his placement on VA ECMO in the cath lab. Over the next 18 hours, his inotropes were weaned off. Uh, his oxygenation uh, had improved to such a degree that the mechanical ventilator uh, had an FiO2 down to 50% from 100%. His lactate normalized. He was peeing with a normal creatinine. So at 18 hours of support, the next morning, he was taken to the operating room, had a mitral valve replacement, and we were able to decannulate him from VA ECMO in the operating room and leave him just with his intraortic balloon pump. He was extubated on post-op day one. This is his immediate post-operative x-ray. You can see how much better his lungs look already. His balloon pump came out on day two and he was discharged home on post-op day seven. Patient three was the patient with the late presentation anterior STEMI uh, who had emergency cabbage and we came out of the operating room on this configuration of VA ECMO with LV vent. He then on, went on to develop refractory VT um, and this was refractory really to all optimal medical therapy. So we transitioned him to uh, BIVAD support. So he had a Protect Duo inserted in his right internal jugular vein uh, into the PA, so inflow in the right atrium to the pump and outflow into the pulmonary artery. And then all we had to do is take out his femoral venous cannula, um, which could be done at the bedside, and he was left with a central LVAD, so LV apex to aorta. Uh, so that then is his BIVAD support. This is a fluoro image of, of putting in his Protect Duo RVADs. You can see here, this is his LV apical cannula and his aortic return cannula. So this is his LVAD component of his MCS. This is a double curve Lundquist wire that's been placed out into his right pulmonary artery. That's a large dilator coming down from his right internal jugular vein. Uh, and then this is the Protect Duo cannula that had been advanced over that wire into his pulmonary artery. And then you can see here the introducer and sheath being pulled back, leaving this cannula in the right pulmonary artery, which then is pulled back slightly into his main PA. For those uh, echocardiographers in the audience, this is a two-chamber view of his left ventricle. This is his LV apical cannula uh, sitting in the middle of his left ventricle, draining his LV. Uh, you can see that he's in VT here at a rapid rate. And then this is his um, uh, Protect Duo cannula. This is the outflow of it sitting in his main pulmonary artery. You can see proximal to his PA bifurcation, which is where you want it to sit. So over the next 12 days, we were able to get control of his VT to some degree with the help of bilat bilateral still like ganglion blocks. Uh, but it was clear that uh, he was going to need transplant evaluation due to his 
uh, burden of ventricular arrhythmia. So he was transferred to Halifax on bivalve support for transplant consideration. At the time we transferred him, he had normal creatinine, normal liver function, normal brain function, normal lung function. Patient four was the left main uh, STEMI uh, who had successful PCI, but progressive refractory profound cardiogenic shock uh, with two arrests prior to his VA ECMO cannulation. Unfortunately, his lactate never normalized. Uh, his kidneys failed and required dialysis. He had persistent vasoactive requirements. He uh, never woke up and had evidence of diffuse cerebral edema on a CT scan of his head. His heart did not recover. And since um, he, he was not a durable VAD candidate due to his um, you know, CNS insult and renal failure requiring dialysis, uh, there was no, uh, nowhere to go and care was withdrawn. I wanted to just show the lactate curves of these four patients, um, which I think really highlights how important the uh, early intervention is in these patients in order to have survivors. So um, the first patient, the 21 year old drowning victim, this is her lactate curve. Uh, you often see the lactate go up after initiation of support because you're actually perfusing end organs that previously had no blood flow. Um, so you can see that you know, her lactate went from 11 up to 14, uh, but you know, over a 48 hour period essentially normalized. The inferior STEMI with MR, uh, you can see that his lactate went up to about seven and normalized very quickly. Likewise, the anterior STEMI that came out of the operating room on, on, uh, on ECMO, lactate went up to six and normalized within less than 24 hours. But the patient that had uh, prolonged profound cardiogenic shock over a 12 hour period on massive doses of vasoactive agents, you can see that following initiation of support, his lactate went to nearly 30. And at 48 hours, we still had a lactate over five. And it just speaks to this adage of time is end organs in the shock patient that the longer a patient is exposed to profound shock, uh, the more difficult it is to reverse their state of multi-system organ failure. Uh, and once your kidneys have, have packed it in, then your chances of recovering that patient uh, declines dramatically and they really no longer are durable VAT or transplant candidates. I just wanted to highlight all the, patient, all the people that are critical in terms of getting these patients through. The first being the perfusion department, which is pictured here who are in-house 24 hours a day when there's a patient on ECMO. Uh, and this translates into, at some stages has been, you know, a month and a half of continual perfusion support uh, in the hospital. This is a, an incredible group of people who are uh, really to thank for the success of this program. Next are the ICU nurses and our nurse associates who are at the bedside 24 hours a day getting these people through. And our physiotherapist, Megan, uh, who, goes through a tremendous effort to rehab these patients, which is incredibly important to their survival. Uh, and then our cardiac anesthesia colleagues, anesthesia assistants, respiratory therapy, pharmacy, interventional radiology, our cardiology colleagues and our critical care physicians. Without these people, we would not get any of these patients through uh, their hospital stay. Uh, thank you very much. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Chris, that was excellent. Um, as per usual, I, I'm just going to stop sharing your screen there. Um, I'm going to open it up to both the chat function as well as to uh, uh, to any comments that people want to unmute themselves for. JF, I'll just give you a first uh, shot at uh, making a comment and or a question, and then uh, we'll see what anybody else has to offer. Yeah, I, my comment, Chris, is, uh, is thank you. I mean, this is clearly elevating uh, the Heart Center in our game overall. Uh, we're all benefiting from the success and, uh, and it just highlights that, you know, with concerted effort, what you can achieve. But I think the important point you were making at the end is really around the uh, intervention early. And uh, if you were to comment a little more, you know, how do you see us sort of moving forward? Uh, it's about a quarter of patients here that we're in cardiogenic shock or acute cardiogenic shock. We use this particular technology and that's potentially the place where we have the most impact long-term to be able to do. Uh, just your thoughts on how we can move forward on that. Yeah, I think that's, you know, the, the most important point from all this is 
early identification of the patients that are in trouble uh, and then deciding on the appropriate level of support to uh, for, for that patient. Obviously, every patient in shock does not need full mechanical support because there's risks that come with that. And I think the progress with the shock team and the CCU um, is is paramount in that. And that really is getting objective data to be able to make decisions. And that is an early art line, early Foley, get a lactate, uh, and in appropriate patients, get a Swan-Gans catheter that allows you to uh, very objectively determine how severe their shock state is and what their dose of, of vasoactive drugs are. Um, and with that, I think we, we really are, have moved towards identifying the patient in trouble early, often coming out of the cath lab, we already have all that information or are putting patients on support before they even leave the cath lab and head up to the CCU. Uh, and I, I think there's been a, a really incredible growth in, in the heart center as a whole team together in terms of, of um, identifying these patients early, intervening early. Um, and I think that you know, mitral regurgitation case is a perfect example of that. There's a patient who is clearly in trouble um, and immediate support is instituted. That patient's lactate went to five. It was normal within hours with normal kidneys. And, you know, that patient went home on, on day seven after their admission. And so I think that obviously is the other extreme end of the spectrum, but I think achievable, um, you know, in, in cases with with really um, astute use of, of the resources we have. Correct. Chris, where do you see, um, where do you see this going? Because I think uh, if I can relate, you know, from a, say a minimally invasive standpoint, uh, Zlatko can probably relate from an aortic standpoint, the more you're able to accomplish kind of the, the program grows as a result because they kind of see what it is that can be done. Um, you know, I now myself look at a, a couple of cases that I've done in the past, you know, a few months and I go, you know what, they may have benefited from either ECMO upfront or ECMO immediately thereafter to get them through instead of kind of struggling as we did or ended up, you know, not having a good result. What are your sort of, what do you see for 2021? And then I think there's a follow-up question by, by Dr. Brown as to uh, what happened to patient number three specifically in long-term follow-up there. Um, yeah, so... I mean, I think the going forward, the biggest impact is really going to be on continuing to grow the shock program and um, identifying, um, you know, really fine tuning our, our process for identifying and treating these patients and, and getting them on the appropriate support um, early. I think that will go a long way to continuing to improve our outcomes. Um, I think we, you know, as a, as a heart center program, are now, you know, the ICU nurses, perfusionists, you know, all the people involved are comfortable with, with managing these patients and what we need to do to get them through. Um, and so I think the next, you know, question then is, is are we in a position now where we're able to start um, the education process and, um, you know, um, patient identification process for transitioning to a durable VAD uh, program, which you know, I think for the province of New Brunswick and, you know, the million or so people that we serve, we would more have more than enough volume uh, to support, a, you know, a modest durable VAD program, which I think would be a tremendous service to the patients we serve. Um, so that's kind of, you know, in general, I think um, where we're going in the immediate and uh, intermediate term. Um, in terms of patient number three, so um, he went to Halifax on BIVAD support. Um, with further time on support, uh, the ventricular arrhythmias did settle um, and they were able to get his RVAD out and left him just with his temporary LVAD. Um, and he eventually underwent uh, durable VAD implantation only, so it did not require transplantation. Um, and that was the last update we've got from Halifax. I don't know exactly what's transpired since his durable VAD was, was implanted. Uh, but I think his case highlights, regardless of, um, you know, whether we end up developing a durable VAD program here or not in New Brunswick, that the re a good relationship with your transplant program is an important component, um, regardless of whether you're providing short-term support only or short-term and long-term support. Because uh, these are patients that, you know, so often may end up requiring transplantation. Um, and so I think you know, maintaining a good relationship with 
our colleagues in Halifax is really important. Uh, we're almost out of time, but I just, uh, Sharif, did you want to quickly ask a question and Chris, super quick answer, and then we'll sign off. Chris, theoretically, um, are there places or uh, is there a possibility in the future of having this as kind of a, a mobile thing? Because often if in the community, if you have a person who's in shock and you can't yeah. manage them, uh, you're going to have a difficult time uh, transferring them. Yeah. Would uh, there ever be a situation where, you know, the, the team comes with all the mobile stuff, gets everything hooked up and then takes them to uh, St. John? Is so, that done elsewhere? Yeah, so it certainly is done elsewhere. I spent a uh, a large chunk of my fellowship doing that, you know, across North Carolina, South Carolina and ambulance or helicopter, depending on the distance. So it is technically doable. Uh, we have the equipment to do it. So we have a cardio help, which is a very transportable ECMO pump. Uh, it would be very easy to have a go bag with all of the necessary equipment. The limitation currently is really that around ambulance service and, and ambulance New Brunswick. Their, their current ambulance sizes are not big enough uh, to allow the personnel and equipment in one ambulance. Now, um, I hope GF doesn't uh, get angry with me with this statement, but um, I think if we really had a patient that um, was young, salvageable, and an extremist, and we didn't think they could safely be transported, um, I think we would have to decide on the fly if there's a way we could technically make that doable until we have an ambulance big enough, uh, whether that is two ambulances or an ambulance and my car, or <laughs> I don't know, but I, I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's technically doable. It is really just logistics. Um, and that would have to be something we would, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully we can improve upon as things go forward. Um, and uh, I don't know if JF has a comment. Uh, yeah, you need a big truck. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Cause really you need, you need, you know, a cannulating surgeon, you need a perfusionist, you need a respiratory therapist, um, ideally a critical care nurse, as well as your paramedic and your patient. Um, and so, you know, I think you could do it with multiple vehicles in present, but uh, it's, it would not be ideal because you would not have um, all the necessary people in the same vehicle with the patient at the same time. Well, Chris, thank you so much. I think that was an excellent talk and an excellent overview and, and really a, a representation of uh, the accomplishments, not only of yourself, obviously, in your leadership capacity, but I think of a lot of other people, as you said, it does take a village. And I think we can all attest to the, uh, to the numerous, numerous people that have really stepped up from, uh, from the ICU to the perfusion group, to the OR nurses, uh, to the cardiologists. And I think just it's been really a group effort, but uh, you know that's how you grow things and that's how you get to the next level. And I think the Heart Center has always been an example of taking on challenges and going getting to the next level. And this is yet another example of, uh, of that success model. So thank you to uh, everyone uh, onwards and upwards. Have a great day. Uh, we'll see you next week. The topic for next week will be race and cardiovascular disease. Uh, and specifically with a, with a bit of a focus on New Brunswick as well, uh, as we look at a topic that's obviously of uh, a great social and, uh, I guess, clinical interest, and I'll be presenting that. All right, have a great day, everyone.